more than anything else, I guess this video will be on the subject of identity, although it's going to cross over into some earlier themes described in the channel about the use of language and the effect of preference and bias on the way we interact with each other and how we play our games and which games we play. So every once in a while, some kind of quiz or survey will go around or someone will post a link to a uh, GM advice book or you know, like Robin's Laws of Good Game Mastering or something like this. And there'll be a flurry of activity as people seek out labels for themselves or labels for the people that they play with. While I have been a very strong proponent of recognizing your preferences, of expanding your experience, and of finding very specific and useful vocabulary for play, I find that I resist the use of labels. And this video is really about why. So my first role-playing game experience was with Dungeons and & Dragons. And the, and the first almost decade of play for me was fantasy. Fantasy supported by the use of Dungeons and Dragons of various types. First edition, advanced, and Beckme and Holmes and Moldvay. So a lot of kind of different generations of Dungeons and Dragons, but the core of the experience was fundamentally the same. A lot of the things that shaped the fantasy element of it was the same. And over that period of time of play, I was growing more and more dissatisfied. We talked about this on the channel before. Now, now, for my position now, I know that the major things that were influencing my dissatisfaction with the game were levels and classes and fantasy. I had gotten tired of fantasy, and I, I think fantasy is just one of the things that I like, but I have a stronger liking for other types of gaming. But classes and, and levels over time has only become something that I dislike more rather than softening on it, where I'll go through periods where I'll, I'll play fantasy you know, for months and months or years at a time classes and levels. I don't like them. Why? Why don't I like them? This is an important question to ask. I don't like them because that's the answer I need to seek if I'm going to consider playing a totally different system, but which also includes the concepts of classes and levels. Is it just D&D &D classes and levels that I don't like, or is it on its entirety the use of classes and levels and role-playing that I don't like. This is something I need to know if I'm going to make an informed choice about games to play in the future. And while that's all very interesting, that's simply an exploration of preference. What do I mean by saying it's an exploration solely of preference? I say that because we could also simply explore function. We could look at the function of levels and the function of classes in gaming and assess whether or not it was appropriate to have them in this game or if this other game over here would be improved by using them or if there's some way we could tweak or modify or change or manipulate the concept, the value, the function of classes and levels fundamentally changing it, but retaining those useful aspects to apply in different ways. That's exploring the function of it. That is broadly applicable to more people in the hobby than simply, I like it. Preference is personal. Function affects us all. So, 
In my past, I've played many different games that employ classes and levels, and I've reacted to them primarily the same way, but it's entirely possible that tomorrow I will discover a game that uses classes and levels, and I like it. Is that going to change my past experience? No, but it will expand and shape my future experience. What kind of player are you? What kind of game master are you? Where on the spectrum of play do you fall? What label should I call you? Are you a gamist? Are you a narrativist? Are you a simulationist? Even though those things aren't really supposed to be applied to people. <laughs> there is this desperate search for labels and we do need to quantify and qualify things if we're going to be able to communicate about them. At the same time, we need to recognize that our experience is not the totality of the thing. It's possible that tomorrow, it's possible that in five minutes, you will learn something new about the thing that changes your perspective and the label becomes flawed and it should be dropped. But because of the power of habit and human nature, we hang on to the label and we limit the way that we can think about things and certainly the way we can talk about them. So, imagine you're a little bored and you're reading articles on the internet and you come across a link to a survey to find out what color lightsaber you might have or what type of player you are. And, well, why not? I'm bored and what difference does it make? Then you go through the however many questions there are for that survey and you discover, boom, you are whatever. Maybe you'll agree. Maybe you're the type of person who automatically disagrees with any label that's applied to you, regardless of how appropriate it might be. Maybe you think, well, you know, I didn't really know that about myself. Let me reconsider. Human reaction is interesting when they discover something that's supposed to be true about them. But let us not forget that these surveys are put together by people just like you and me using whatever terms, whatever concepts, whatever play experience they have managed to have. You might read through a survey and the wording of it is elegant and you think, wow, this person really has a wide ranging experience of things. And then you can find another survey where it's very, very obvious that you're being led toward very specific choices or there's really only one choice that matters. You might have to answer 12 questions, but it's only question four that really matters. That kind of thing. You can go through a very long and seemingly detailed survey about what kind of player you are, but the person who wrote it is only thinking in terms of one game or one tradition of playing. This label put on you from the outside has a chance to affect your thinking about yourself and the way that you will approach the hobby in the future. It will certainly affect the way people see you if you post, I'm a whatever. It's interesting, but this is in a way the price we pay for being an animal that communicates via language. Our words are powerful. When we use our words to describe experiences that we have had, experiences that are now set and locked in time, F fixed points in time, I guess is the appropriate uh, Doctor Who statement to put in there. If we use our language to try and define and refine and explain and share those concepts, those experiences, those moments in time, then we're doing ourselves a service and we're doing other people a service in trying to understand us. If we take shorthand and say, well, I like this, then we're only talking about preference. And who cares right? what you think your preference is right now? It was different in the past and it will change again in the future. Maybe not a lot, but it will. It's a river. It's constantly being shaped and constrained by what's available, ex 
extended periods of exposure. It's a lot of food that adults eat that babies can't stand. How does that happen? Their preferences change. Why? This is what I'm getting at. The importance of understanding where you've been far outweighs your momentary perception of who you are. And so, what this video really is about is identity. We are a community of gamers. We do not share as many preferences as we might think. The games we think that everyone is playing really aren't the games that everyone is playing. And the way that they're playing them doesn't really have to be the way that we're written or the way we think they are written. The depth, the breadth, the variance out there in the hobby is breathtaking and it really should be exciting and something that we can explore, much in the same way that exploration was such an important part of early games. The things that we explore have changed, have expanded, and that's great. And it's going to continue. There are more people out there now making new games and figuring out ways to realign the parts of old games than at any point in gaming's history. But it's important to remember that those people have been there from the very beginning of the hobby. Once the first commercially available role-playing game entered the market, it almost guaranteed that there would be more. And there were. There are literal thousands of systems out there. I'm not talking about settings. I'm talking about systems. And there are thousands more that are hidden away. People were unwilling or unable to share them. The hobby is bigger than we know. We are small parts of it. And we change over time. What doesn't change is what we have done and how. And that is something we can talk about with a great deal of detail and growing understanding without obfuscating it behind labels.